to you and what they're doing and what they might think. When you worship, I just want to encourage you to open up your hands because when you open up your hands to God, you're letting it go to him, right? Amen. So let's just let him have it and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, right? Lord. Amen. All right, so we're going to do something fun. I know we're kind of scattered around. But I want you to point at your neighbor and I want you to say, it starts with you. Okay, now I want you to do it again, but this time I want you to say it and I want you to pay attention to your hand. Say, it starts with you. But it really starts with me. Because you got three fingers pointing right back at you. Just saying. And you know, your greatest work isn't inside the church, it's outside the walls of the church. Amen. Because the last time I checked, there's not a ministry called Mormon the Pew. Just saying. It's outside the walls. And it's wherever you go. Because it's not his pastor's job to go with you to the, to the grocery store. It's not his job to go to Walmart with you. It's not his job to go to the mall or go to school with you. That's your job. You all have a job. And you're all called. And that is your mission field. So maybe you're not called to China. Maybe you're not called to Africa. Maybe some of you are saying, thank you, Jesus, you're not called to the hill with us. But you're all called. So each and every one of you are missionaries where you work and live. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So we're going to open up with a verse that we all know. I get my cheaters on. My, my husband calls it head jewelry because I only need it to read. <laughs> uh, Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Jesus said unto him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So I decided to look up the uh, definition of neighbor. It's in the free dictionary online. You can look it up. The first two are typical. A person who lives near or next to another. A person, place, or thing adjacent to or located near another. But it's the last two that got me. One's fellow human being. And the last one, in order to be a neighbor, it is a person who shows kindliness toward fellow humans. So guess what? Wherever you go, that's your neighbor. It might be that thorn in your side at work, that coworker that's trying to get you fired or wants your job or is bad mouthing you behind your back. That's your neighbor. It's that one that the trash is all piling up around in the yard and they don't cut their grass. That's your neighbor. It's that bully at school. That's your neighbor. You know, where, where we're at, we wouldn't get very far if we um, got caught up on outward appearance. You know, we're dealing with drug addicts, prostitutes, skirts too short, shirts too low, pants sagging. Daddy God says, get over it. That's my diamond in the rough. Whether they got spiked hair, tattoos, gauges, doesn't matter. That's his lost sheep. And that's where we come in. That is your neighbor. And you know, it's, it's so easy. Can I just share a story? It's so easy to love people where they're at. It really is. Just total strangers. I saw a woman one time coming out of a grocery store. She was clutching a box of alcohol, sobbing. And I'm thinking, dear Lord, she's just broken. I need to pray for her. God was like, yeah. Kicks me in the butt. Go pray for her. So I literally chased up to this woman through the parking lot, knocking on her window. And I'm like, tap, tap, tap. Can you roll your window down? And so by then she's like, yes. She says, and I said, I saw you. Can I pray for you? Those five simple words, that's all Daddy God wants from us sometimes. It's just, can I pray for you? And it was like this light showed up, and she just broke down in tears. She tells me her story. Dear Lord, there is nothing I can do for this woman. Only Jesus could. And I prayed for her, and I said, in Jesus' name, amen, and I left. And you know what? I'll probably never see her again, but I planted a seed. And someone else will water it. And someone else will harvest it. And that's what you do when you give to your local church. That's what you do when you give the missions. One day in heaven, we're all going to be part of that. And you're going to have people just come up to you and say, thank you. Thank you for sending that missionary. Or thank you for stopping to recognize me in that place, you know, that place of pain. You know, and I still think about the one young man. He was at a, he, um, stopped at a McDonald's and, uh, so I could use the restroom. And he is just with a great attitude. He's picking up trash and the, the trash is overflowing and he's just got a great attitude and he's smiling and just, you know, it's just you can just tell he's got a really sweet spirit about him. And I'm just watching and I'm like, wow, what a great young man. 
So I walked over to him. I said, hey, I just want to bless you. I said, I just want you to know that Jesus loves you. And he's like, you don't even know. You don't even know. And I was like, no, what? He goes, I asked for God to give me a word today. I just needed some encouragement because I was ready to hang it up. I said, well, I just want you to know that he loves you and he sees you. And I said, and I just want to bless you. And I handed him some money. And you know what? I said, I just want to pray for you. He goes, well, I got to work. I said, that's all right. We can walk and pray. We walked to the trash and we walked back, you know? And that's all God wants. You know, and I tell the youth all the time, you got to be willing to step outside yourself, yes. step across that chicken line, and get uncomfortable. Yes. Get outside yourself. Step out of that comfort zone. Because if you're comfortable, there's something wrong. God wants to use each and every one of us. And I'm telling you, you can blow the doors off of this place. You have got such a feel. There are so many kids out here and families. And, you know, the world wants our children. So... We're called to be salt and light. And I don't know about you, but if we're, you know, it talks about how if you don't stay salty, you're good for nothing. Well, I'm staying salty. I don't know about you, but I'm salty. So let's go out into the communities. Let's be the salt and light. Let's reach these lost children who have no one and families, and let's bring them back in because they're not going to just randomly walk in. They need you to be the hands and feet of Christ, to be a missionary where you work and live in your community, get involved in your school system, go to school board meetings, Get involved in your local government. Know what is going on in your community, and let's make a difference. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Hey, good morning. Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. A uh, little history on myself. I, I grew up in a small farming community in Indiana, and so this summer, 20 years being in East St. Louis, so, I mean, you guys know the history of the city, so I don't really have to go too deep into it. But um, I'm a 1991 Teen Challenge graduate, uh, four year or three years master's commission. Went on a missions trip to Washington, D.C. to work with the missionary. And uh, as I was coming back to uh, Indiana, I heard the Lord say, you're going to work with that missionary. And I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> Where he was at was a really bad area. Southeast Washington, D.C., Marshall Heights neighborhood. And, uh, you know, after about six months of battling with God, I lost. And so I, I ended up moving out there and I applied for U.S. mission status. And uh, I was only supposed to be there two years as a missionary in training. I ended up staying out there for four years with him and, and really got a good training understood what I was getting myself into. And as I was praying, asking God, where do you want me to go? Because in the missionary training program, you launch into another city to plant, another city work. I wanted to go to Gary, Indiana. Mm -hmm. That's where I really wanted to go, but there were stipulations and doors got shut. And, and so that didn't, that didn't open up. So then I heard the Lord say, I want you to go to East St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And as I applied to come here, they weren't as friend, they were just as bad as Indiana was. I remember having a conversation with the superintendent, and he said, Why should we send a white guy to an all black city plant church? I said, Let me ask you a question. How many black pastors do you have in line waiting to go? He said, None. And I said, Then what's the hold up? I'm the one taking all the risk. And so he said, Okay, we'll let you go. And so, you know. At, in its heyday, there used to be three assembly God churches in East St. Louis. Yes. I believe the last one closed in 1983. Yes, I'm right State Street. Do you know that uh, East St. Louis is down to 17,000 people, but on Sunday mornings it swells up to 30,000? That's all the people that drive in to go to church. From uh, 2004 to 2018, there were 454 murders. Now, our, our buildings, we have uh, four buildings. They're right down on North Knight Street. So if you know downtown where the old uh, Montgomery Wards is and uh, the old Kroger's, the old Aldi's, the old McDonald's, we're right behind the McDonald's. There's a, a, a Phil's Lock Shop. Right there is where we're at. And so... Going into East St. Louis, I knew 
uh, nothing about the city. All I knew and, and it had been told was it's a very violent city. But after being in D.C., to me, East St. Louis really wasn't that bad. Because I'd seen a lot of stuff out there. And to me, it's a small town. Yeah, it's pretty dangerous, but I'm not by myself. I've got God with me. Yeah. He's the one that called me. It's his ministry, and he'll take care of me. Years ago, I had a lady tell me, honey, you can go wherever you want, because God just signed four warring angels to you. You have two to the front and two to the rear. They're always with you. I was in a church in Destin, Florida, back in 2020, and after the service, a lady came up to me. She was trembling. And I said, what's the matter? She said, uh, I've seen a nine-foot warring angel behind you. She said, he was hovering over you. Wherever you went, he went. He was in protect mode over you. I said, you only, you seen one? She said, yes. I'm thinking, where were the other three? <laughs> I guess God felt safe because I was in church. So when I got to St. Louis, I had a little Ford, Ford Aspire. A little little coffin on wheels. <laughs> I found a bus bench the first day I sit on. I said to the guy, I said, I'm here now. What do you want me to do? And I heard the Lord say three things. He said, Jay, I want you to reach out to the addicted, the afflicted, the hopeless. I want you to raise up pastors. And I want you to plant churches. You know, today we have 10 inner city church plants and ministry points now across the United States in eight different cities. Amen. It all started right there in St. Louis. Yeah. And do you know today we run all of our ministries debt-free? We don't have any debt. Just here, we have three works and seven buildings. And we own them all. We have no debt. When I got off that bus bench that day, I was trying to figure out, well, what am I going to do here? And I started to see homeless people when I see I seen uh, people throughout the city. And so I just loaded up my car with food and clothes. And I'd go drive around East St. Louis and look for people who look like they're homeless and hungry. And I'd get out and give them clothes and feed them. With the windows down and the doors unlocked. Because people pay attention on the corners. And you're pulling up on the corner. They're looking right at your car. And they see the windows up and the doors locked. And what that does is signifies fear. And God's called us to not walk in fear, but to walk in faith. Amen. <clears throat> so, what do you do when you're at a stop sign? Drug dealer jumps in your car with you. Yeah, that happened. Well, you start preaching Jesus that, and they jump out as quick as they jump in. <laughs> I begin to learn the city. I begin to learn where the crack houses were. I begin to learn the corners of the city where the gangs and the drug dealers were. And it took a little bit of time, but God began to give me staffing. And so I had a big custom built cooker made. And the first time we took it out, it was on a corner where they said, that's a very dangerous corner in the city. People have been shot and killed there. And on a Friday night, it, it would have 10, 15 guys hanging out in that corner. And they were pretty rough looking. Well, I didn't tell my, my pastors that what we were going to do because I knew they'd flip out. And so we showed up on that corner with that cooker, and I shut the van off. I said, are you guys ready? And they said, what do you mean are we ready? I said, we're getting out tonight. We're going to cook for these people. Well, what's going to happen? I said, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know this. We're not going to act all churchy with them. We're just going to feed them. We're just going to develop a relationship with yes. them. Friendship. Yes. And we took that corner. You know, it took two years for those men to ask me to pray for them. And one day I had them all in a circle holding hands and I was in the center praying for them. That corner doesn't exist anymore. It's been gone for a long time. God cleaned it up. And then we started hitting the crack houses. I parked that cooker in front of the crack house. And man, we would feed a lot of people. It was so funny because people would come in there, white people would come in there in their cars on Fridays, buying crack, and we're shoving hot dogs through the car window, too. They're getting a hot dog in their crack at the same time. Boldness. There's a hotel that's by our, well, they tore it down, but there used to be a hotel by our building, the Royal Inn. 
it's, it was nothing more than a brothel and a, a drug den. And when we started doing all these cookouts, and then we were doing outreaches and all the housing projects, back in the day there were 15 housing projects in the city. I got moon bounce, I got uh, bounce houses too. And so we pulled to, we wouldn't even have to knock on the doors. We would just pull the cooker and the van in there and we'd get the bounce houses out, we'd have a crowd of 200 instantly. We did it for years. And so, I used to buy all my bread at Aldi's. And one day the lady, the manager asked me, why do you buy so much bread? I said, because I feed people in East St. Louis. She said, you're not buying bread anymore. We'll just donate it to you. <laughs> so they, they start donating their bread to me. And one day she called me. It was a Saturday afternoon. She said, Pastor Jay, she said, we have all these bundles of roses. And we're going to throw them away. But I felt like I was supposed to call you today. Can you use them? I said, I'll take them. And I text the pastor. I said, be in the building tonight at 7 o'clock. I didn't tell them what we were going to do, so they didn't freak out. Because I have a mission for you. They, they got there, and they're like, what are we doing tonight, Pastor? And I opened up that van, I said, I got all these buckets of roses. And I've been wanting to go to the Royal Inn for, for a while. We're going to go there tonight. It was a Saturday night. I said, it's going to be real simple. We're going to go in, we're going to knock on the doors, and when the ladies come, we're going to give them a bundle of roses. We're going to tell them that Jesus loves them. We're going to ask them if they want prayer, and we're going to invite them to church in the morning. Do you know what happened to a couple of those doors? Children answered the doors. Do you know what that means? Their kids are either seeing what their mom was doing or they're being locked up in the bathroom. Why would the church be there? We make it so complicated. We want to go to the easy places where God's called us to to the hard places. And we, we went, and we had a couple of ladies that did come to church. Matter of fact, the, the hotel was owned by these uh, Indian couple. And they had all their gods in their apartment. Do you know that the gentleman came to our church, he got saved, right. gave his life to Christ. And a couple months later, he died. If nothing else, maybe we were sent there just for him. I don't know. But I, I do know that we planted a church there, and I pastored it for four years. And uh, there's a lady named Shamika Black. And when I got there in 04, I met her in 06. And do you know she's still there, and she pastors that church. She's been with me now for 18 years. But here's what's really crazy. The last church to close in East St. Louis, she was a little girl there. She was at Assembly God Church. They transitioned, they left, they went to uh, Swansea. And then when I come to East St. Louis to plant church, I got introduced to her and I brought her on. She was in one of those Jesus only churches, so she wore skirts and no makeup. And I thought she's going to change real quick because when you go in these abandoned buildings and these rats that look like little kittens come running across the floor because <laughs> there's homeless people living in those buildings. She's going to change real quick, but I'm not going to tell her to change. You will, Lord. And she changed. And when we launched that church, she was there. And now she's pastoring. That's like apostolic. That's like prophetic. That God knew when she was a little girl that one day we would come and plant the church and she would pass through. If you get anything from this message today, this is what I want you to hear. I want you to hear this loud and clear. When the church reaches a place of brokenness for your city, then God will give you your city. You cannot reach your city until you understand why it's broken. You're a lighthouse in darkness. And some of you are tired. You're wore out. You're weary. But you're still here. There's a new generation coming into this church. Some of you are going to like it. You'll leave. But if you'll hold steady 
and you'll pull your part. And it doesn't have to be anything real big. If nothing else, just hold the pastor's arms up while he's in battle. Be his armor bearer. But if you'll have eyes to see and ears to hear, and you'll allow the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do, the past is the past. What happened is that's over. It's a new season. And it's not going to be done the way you used to do it. Because if it was, this place would be full. It's a new season. Which means new identity. And if you'll hang in there. And you'll find a place of ministry. Because if we're believers this morning, none of us have an ex uh, uh, exemption cards. We are all called to be missionaries where we work and where we live. We are all called, we are orchestrated, ordained of the Holy Spirit to serve in this house because this is your church. That God will change it and God will grow it. And it will be amazing. But it's going to take time. And you're going to get frustrated. But if you'll hold on, and you'll have eyes to see and ears to hear. It's going to be incredible what God wants to do. Faith will propel God's plan for your life. While fear will cripple you from ever taking your first step that requires action on your part. Before you can walk in the favor of God, first you must learn how to walk by faith in God. If you walk by faith with what God is wanting to do with this place, then His favor will rest on it. And it will grow by leaves and bounds. And you're going to get the people in here, they're going to cuss, and they're probably going to be smoking, and kicking cigarette buds outside your door. But you know what? It's not my job. It's not your job to change anybody. That's the Holy Spirit's job. It's our job just to love people where they're at. And if we'll just love them and encourage them, they'll keep coming back. But if we get all churchy on they ain't coming back. Just love them. I say it all the time. We have to love Jesus and people love the hell out of them. Because people live hellish lives. After, after we launched that uh, East St. Louis church, you know, when I got there, I'd been here four months. Well, not even that. I'd been here uh, three months. And the church in Edwardsville, the pastor called me up one day and said, hey, I want to have lunch with you. And so I met him for lunch. And he said, we want to invest in your ministry. Do you know that day he gave me a check for $18,000? He said, we want to help you buy a building. I bought my first two buildings for $15,000. They were bad shape. People were like, what are you doing? <laughs> One had fire in it. It's all boarded up. I said, you know what? what we can afford because they're seeing the industry and that's sustained debt. And, and God will work with it. And he did. The beautiful buildings now. They were so much when we got them. But after we got started, uh, in 04 and 07 the district called me and they said hey we're going to close the property over there in Washington Park but before we do we want to know do you want it I said well I'll take it on one condition if I take it you cannot tell me what I can and can't do with it Because I'm taking all the risk. You don't have anything to lose. In its heyday, that church, they said, ran about four to 500 people. Planted in 1953. They said it was a strong missions giving church. But when I took the church, it had 10 people in it. It was dying. And so we just went ahead and helped it die. We put death to it. Because I told the people, look, we can't run this thing like it is. This is the last Sunday it's open. We're
or shutting the doors or locking them, you want to go to the Civil uh, God Church, go to East St. Louis. And I let that building sit for a year. Because it was a disrepair. It was in bad shape. There had not been any money, nothing put in that building for 30, 40 years. It was bad. And so as I was in the process of working on it, I heard the Lord say, I, we had an African American church in there, and it went for about eight years, and we ended up closing that because it just wasn't working. But in that small building, if you've been over there to remember the, the, the gymnasium, the small building, when I was looking at it one day, this is what I heard the Lord say. I want you to plant a Spanish-speaking church in that building. I said, Lord, that makes no sense. There are no Hispanics who live in Washington Park. He said, I want you to plant a church, a Spanish-speaking Spanish church in that building. And do you know for 13 months I prayed and asked God for a pastor? I even went to St. Louis and met a guy, a Spain pastor. He laughed at me. He said, you're crazy. Well, there's this guy when he was 17 years old. He went to uh, New Mexico, uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico uh, Penitentiary, Maximum Security at 17 years old. He got out. He was in Juarez with his buddies, and they uh, they broke they drove through the checkpoint, and they got chased by the police. They lost the police. Their car broke down on the side of the road on the highway, and where it broke down, there's a Pontiac dealership there. This is 1985, and so the the guy driving the car breaks into the dealership, finds the keys to a brand new Pontiac Firebird drove it through the glass windows, picked his buddies up, then they blew through two more uh, checkpoints with the police and they had a shootout with the police. He got 16 years for that. They sent him to Santa Fe, back up to the penitentiary up there, and he was so violent, liked to fight. He did a lot of time in consultory confinement. So then they sent him to New York prison. And then from there, they moved him over to Camden, Missouri. And he was in consultory confinement one day when somebody slid a Bible underneath his door. He began to read the Word of God, gave his life to Christ, was baptized in the Holy Ghost out in the wreck yard. And then they released him. He got on a bus, went back down to Las Cruces, New Mexico, where he was from, found a small Assembly God church there, and that's where he, he tapped in, that's where he met his wife. He got married. For five years, he'd go to Juarez and do street ministry every weekend. And then one day, God said, Ramon, I have enough Ramones here. I need you to move up to the East St. Louis area because I want you to plant church. He was not credentialed. He wasn't even a pastor. He moved up here and he even worked at the Walmart in O'Fallon making donuts. And he'd been here for a year. And then God put us together. We planted that church. Yeah, we were in a small building. Now he's in the big building. He's been with me now 16 years. Let me tell you, it's a strong, vibrant, Pentecostal, Assembly God church. They move in the spirit. They, they, they cast demons out people all the time. It just goes with the territory. It goes with the turf. Sometimes we want the big picture. We want God to do it now. Do it now, God. And then we get mad at him because he didn't do it on our time. You have to understand something about him. He doesn't know what time is. He's eternal. He has no beginning. He has no end. He's the Alpha and Omega. We just need to be caught up in the spirit. We need to be patient. Because we may not think he's doing anything, but behind the scenes, he's doing a lot of stuff. Just like the stories you told us, Pastor, with McDonald's. Yeah. We may not see the big picture, but he's well aware. 
He's got a theater going on here. He's putting all the people in their places. What, what would happen if 200 people just showed up on Sunday? You wouldn't be able to handle it. He's making us ready for the harvest. He's making us ready for the, the, the fields. Because he's ready to harvest. This is nothing but a grain bin. After we launched the Hispanic church, I heard the Lord say, I want you to reach the Bosnians. I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> Bosnians, what in the world are you talking about? <laughs> he said they're over the river. They're in St. Louis. So I researched it. And the thing I understood was there are 10 Bosnian communities in the United States, but St. Louis has the largest one. There's 70,000 Bosnians here, and 90% of them are Muslim, and nobody was reaching them. Not in the assemblies of God, and that bothered me. So all I said was, God, I'll do it. Send me the pastor. Do you know it took me nine months to pray through? And one day I get a phone call from a guy named Andrew Austin from Janesville, Wisconsin. He says, give me your name and number and heard that you're looking for somebody to reach the Bosnians. I said, what's your story? He said, my wife and I applied to be world missionaries of Bosnia. We were turned down. We were told we didn't have enough experience. So as we researched the Bosnian populations, we found out that St. Louis has the largest one, and we feel called to reach them. I said, congratulations, Andrew Austin. You are our church planner. <laughs> he got quiet. <laughs> and he said, wait a minute. How do you know that? You don't even know me. I said, Andrew, you called me. I didn't call you. Mm -hmm. oh, Andrew, I've been praying for nine months. He picked up the phone. Amen. Andrew, you're supposed to do this. If you don't do it, you'll be out of God's will. He'll find someone else, and it'll just take that much longer. But if you decide to do it, I'll help you. Mm -hmm. So he agreed that day to do it. He moved his family here. He got national point. He's national point just like me. He got to the point. He got his budget raised. He said, "We have to get a building." I said, "Look, you cannot go get a loan for a building." He said, "What would we do?" I said, "If God doesn't show up or show out, buddy, we're in trouble. He has to do it." Well, how's he going to do it? I said, "I don't know." <laughs> but I do, I do know this: we have three policies. If it's God's will, it's His bill. If you send it, we'll spend it. If it's free, it's me. Because we've had buildings given to us. we bought buildings. But in everything God's done, it hasn't been anything I've done. And I said, he'll do it again. Amen. And you know, he did it again. He used a, a company that you buy their decor in, a multi-billion dollar company. And then he used a multi-billion dollar ice cream company. Both the CEOs and their wives are Christians. They both sent checks for $50,000 each to us. We bought a building for $100,000 cash. And we opened up by Bosnia International Outreach. And Andrew's still there. All these years later, that was back in 2011 when we started that. I heard the Lord say, I want you to plant an urban outreach in Cleveland, Ohio. And I said, well, God, you have to give me the planters. And he did. He gave me the Willard family. And Bob and Judy have four kids. And I said to Bob, look, we're going to plant this in the Buckeye neighborhood. That's the worst neighbor. That's kind of our thing. And so he said, well, we'll look for a house. I said, I don't think you should live there, bro. He said, no, we're going to live there. So they bought a house. They started doing ministry. And what happened was it forced them to plant a church in their house. Could you imagine on Sundays and Thursday nights having 20 to 40 people from the hood in your house? Then they started an after-school tutoring program. Monday through Friday, they would have over 20 kids in their house. And then the most amazing thing happened. The 1,600 square foot house next door came up for sale and the bank sold them the house for $500. I'll tell you what kind of neighborhood you live in. Come to East St. Louis, we'll get you a house in the tax auction for $600. Did they know they were going to play house church? No. You don't know what God wants to do here, but he does. The word says that if we're faithful in the little things, 
then we'll be faithful much. Just keep doing what you're doing. We can't grow anything. It's His Spirit. The Spirit of God is what grows the church. We just have to play our part. After they planted the house, the church the bank called Bob and said, look, we have this old tavern that has a large building attached to it and a, and a, and a two-bedroom apartment. We want to stay the building. And Bob said, well, how much do you want for it? They said, we'll let you have it for $500. So they wrote the check out and bought the building. Six months went by and the bank called Bob up and said, look, we, we uh, want to talk to you and your wife. Can you come to the bank? And they go to the bank and the man says, look, we see all the ministry that you're doing in your neighborhood. And so we want to reissue you a check for $500 just to give you the building. You understand the banks take our money, right? They don't give us money. But that's how the kingdom of God works. If we'll just be faithful with what God's telling us to do, then he will get the multiply. He will give us what we need to do the rest of the work. He can speak to a farmer that's a multi-millionaire sitting here. Amen. And just one service where you check for $100,000 or whatever. It's not our place to tell God how to do it. It's our place to do what he says. Amen. When he says to do it. Because he is the author of our faith. He's still writing the book. Amen. He's still finishing the last chapters of the church. Yes. And if we'll just be obedient, then we will see the harvest. We have an urban outreach in Covington, Kentucky. And it's what we call the Lord's Gym. It's a boxing gym. I don't have the stats for 23, but I know in 22, they did 20,000 mills. They helped 4,000 people get employment. There was a guy for a short time, he had a run-in in that gym, and then he ended up our urban outreach in Phoenix, Arizona. We have an urban outreach in Phoenix, so he, we had a guy out there that, that planted it. The guy stayed for three years, and he left. And so all of a sudden now, I'm stuck with this guy named Zippy Dirks. Who the heck is Zip, Zippy Dirks? I, I told Zippy, you sound like you're like a, in a country band. Zippy Dirk and the good old boys. <laughs> when he was eight years old, he seen the police come to his house and arrest his mom for murder. So you know where his life went. He's 36 years old now. He got can he, he played for the minor league football. He got cancer. He was a drug addict. Told him he wouldn't have kids. You know, he's married today and has five kids. When we were, when when the one guy was in Phoenix running that work, we were moving around with him. They drove me crazy. I said, dude, just pick a spot and stay. You can't keep moving around. But he left. And I got stuck with Zippy Dirks. And so I've spent the last three years working with this guy, mentoring him, training him. This year, <clears throat> we're only, what, four months in this year? This year, they've already taken 477 people off the streets and put them in faith-based programs like Teen Challenge and Victory Outreach. They've taken women off the streets, women that had kids living in their cars homeless, put them in emergency housing. Last year, they took 1,056 people off the streets. Same thing. In 2022, when he took it over, 575 people in the, in the three years that he's been running Urban Outreach of Phoenix, they've taken 2,083 people off the streets, put them in the faith-based programs and, uh, and emergency housing. He went from one campus now to four campuses. They have one in Central, South, East, a discipleship gym. They do two services in bilingual. One service has introduced Celebrate Recovery. They have 100 kids every week coming to one of the churches. Every month they get three 53-foot trailers of donations given to them. And last year they were given $10 million worth of stuff given to them. They have been able to take what they've been given and literally fed that to the whole uh, uh, Phoenix area to where they still have enough stuff left that now they have uh, adopted 22 Indian reservations that they're putting stuff into. That's just one guy. Because we took a chance. We took a risk. We cannot walk in fear. 
the ministry of the church through discipleship is outreach, evangelism, and missions. It's the only healthy component of making disciples. If we're going to make disciples, we have to do it through evangelism, outreach, and missions. We have to go out and bring them in. And if we'll do it, God will multiply and God will build his church. One last story. We're in Indianapolis. Indianapolis has a large homeless population. 11 homeless camps throughout the city. Chris Padgett, he, he's a, they're an average guy there, born and raised and grew up in Grand City. So he actually left here to go to Indiana. Chris and I were trying to figure out, well, how are we going to reach people? What are we going to do? So I don't want to do what everybody else is doing. Everybody's feeding them. Everybody's clothing them. What can we do different? And we came up with this idea. What if we had a custom-built trailer that's uh, made into a two-shower unit that you can pull? It's got the water and everything. We can pull up anywhere, and we can give out showers. Number one uh, request in the homeless community are socks. And so... We found an RV company. All the RVs are made in northern Indiana. And I, the church up there supports us. We have friends up there. And so we started researching. We found a company that's owned by the, the Mennonites, Forest River. And so they, they said, we'll build you that trailer. I said, well, how much is it going to cost? They said, $32,000. And we want 10% down. So I wrote them a check for 10% down. And Chris said, where's the rest of the money come from? I said, I don't know. It's kind of ironic. You know, God tells us to tie 10%. The RV companies tell, tell us to tie 10% to them. So I think God should just take care of it. <laughs> he needs to speak to someone and tell them to pay for that thing. You know, he did. He spoke to those people in that ice cream company. I get a text from the wife, and she says, uh, we're praying about buying that trailer for you. And I called Chris and said, they're going to buy that trailer for you. He said, how do you know? I said, you don't text someone to say you're praying about. If you text them, it means you're getting serious. You're going to do it. And the next week, she said, we'll buy that trailer for you. And she bought that trailer for us. So it's been operation now for two years. Not only has it served Indianapolis, but we had it in Evansville, Indiana, serving the homeless veterans. Showering the homeless veterans. The mayor said to us, you guys are welcome here any time. We love this, what you're doing. It was in Louisville, Kentucky last month. Showering the homeless. But there was one particular lady, she was married, and they had two kids, and they'd been homeless for a couple months living in her car. And she got a shower, and she came out, she was weeping. She was broken. Chris said, what's the matter? She said, I've had these new clothes for a month. I didn't want to put them on because I, I smelled so bad. And today I got to put them on. Don't take for granted the things God's given you. Amen. Don't take for granted this beautiful facility that you have. Don't wallow in self pity. Woe is me. It ain't like the good old days. There are better days coming. But what happens today, what happens tomorrow, you'll determine it. Determined by your attitude, your willingness, and your faith. If you're willing to, to go all in, you're willing to say, you know what? We're going to turn this thing around. We're going to make this an elite assembly got church in the metro area. Then God will do it. But everything rests. The vision, the dreams you have, it's all on you. But if you allow the Holy Spirit to birth in you dreams and vision of what He wants to do, if you'll join ranks with Him, if you'll stand beside Him, if you'll stand behind Him, and you'll say, Lord, you take the role, you take the ranks, we'll follow you. Then you will see greater days.